Cambridge English Advanced One, published by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge English Language Assessment, 2014. This recording is copyright. CD two. This is the Cambridge English Advanced Test Three. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you'll hear this sound. You'll hear each piece twice. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. You'll have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There'll now be a pause. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear two people discussing climate change. Now look at questions one and two. Well, that TV debate about climate change certainly gave us plenty to think about.、Mm, certainly did, but it wasn't what was said that worried me most. We've all heard those dire predictions before, though that doesn't mean we should take them any less seriously. Didn't it strike you that some of those speakers hadn't much of a clue?、Mm. It seems understandable that practically everybody wants to express an opinion about climate change. It's going to affect us all. But an uninformed opinion doesn't have much value. I know what you mean. These days, any celebrity, no matter what they're famous for, has an opinion worth asking. It seems.、Mm. About the debate, though, I think the same thing happens with articles on climate change. Obviously, nobody will read them if they're too stuffy, and a bit of controversy livens them up, which is fine, I suppose, as long as journalists don't go too far.、Mm, so long as they don't think they're supposed to be jokey. Quite. Their function is to get the message across, let the public get a true picture of what scientists are doing. But we need to know reports are accurate, so really, scientists need to vet them.、Mm, I think there's always this sort of problem with research that captures the public imagination. Well, that TV debate about climate change certainly gave us plenty to think about.、Mm, certainly did. But it wasn't what was said that worried me most. We've all heard those dire predictions before, though that doesn't mean we should take them any less seriously. Didn't it strike you that some of those speakers hadn't much of a clue?、Mm. It seems understandable that practically everybody wants to express an opinion about climate change. It's going to affect us all, but an uninformed opinion doesn't have much value. I know what you mean. These days, any celebrity, no matter what they're famous for, has an opinion worth asking. It seems.、Mm. About the debate, though, I think the same thing happens with articles on climate change. Obviously, nobody will read them if they're too stuffy, and a bit of controversy livens them up, which is fine, I suppose, as long as journalists don't go too far.、Mm, so long as they don't think they're supposed to be jokey. Quite. Their function is to get the message across. Let the public get a true picture of what scientists are doing, but we need to know reports are accurate. So, really, scientists need to vet them.、Mm, I think there's always this sort of problem with research that captures the public imagination. Extract two. You hear two pilots taking part in a discussion program about an aerobatics team in which they fly. Now look at questions three and four. The new training session is tough, isn't it? We just eat, drink, and practice flying, and that's pretty hard work. 
But early on in the season, you do improve at quite a rapid rate, so I do find that very fulfilling. As you know, I'm in a new plane this year, which is taking some getting used to, and I've had to change some of my techniques to suit. It's been a really steep learning curve, but I can't complain after making it onto the team for the World Championships. Yeah, we stand a chance at the Aerobatic Championships as long as we don't compromise on the team standards. Whether we'll win or not is a different matter. The last few years, we've had a good core team, and since winning bronze last year, our members have been steadily improving. But this means there'll be added pressure on the pilots, which may go against us. We'll be lucky to get a team win, but we are at least aiming for some individual medals. We've got two pilots who were in the world top ten, so that's what we're aiming for. The new training session is tough, isn't it? We just eat, drink, and practice flying, and that's pretty hard work. But early on in the season, you do improve at quite a rapid rate, so I do find that very fulfilling. As you know, I'm in a new plane this year, which is taking some getting used to, and I've had to change some of my techniques to suit. It's been a really steep learning curve, but I can't complain after making it onto the team for the World Championships. Yeah, we stand a chance at the Aerobatic Championships as long as we don't compromise on the team standards. Whether we'll win or not is a different matter. The last few years, we've had a good core team, and since winning bronze last year, our members have been steadily improving. But this means there'll be added pressure on the pilots, which may go against us. We'll be lucky to get a team win, but we are at least aiming for some individual medals. We've got two pilots who were in the world top ten, so that's what we're aiming for. Extract three. You hear two friends talking about online book reviews. Now look at questions five and six. Apparently, there's an author who's been writing glowing online reviews of his own book, using a pseudonym, of course, and slating the work of other writers. Pretty shocking, don't you think? <laughs> Trust you to pick up on that. There are plenty of others who are quite genuine, you know. Well, okay, maybe it is unfair to generalise, but honestly, I'd far rather read a book myself than plough through other people's opinions of one I might want to read in the future.、Mm. There are reams of them. And you've no idea who posts them. People with literary pretensions, I suppose. <laughs> Surely it's good to get a range of views. I'm capable of making up my own mind, thank、mm. you. Well, I write reviews sometimes. It's not as good as swapping ideas with the other members of my reading group, of course. No feedback, but it certainly does focus the mind. I'm sure I get more out of the books as a result. So, do you think it'll turn you into an author too? <laughs> Don't mock. I get plenty of writing practice at work. All those dreary reports.、Mm. So it's good to be able to write about something I find interesting for a change. Apparently, there's an author who's been writing glowing online reviews of his own book, using a pseudonym, of course, and slating the work of other writers. Pretty shocking, don't you think? <laughs> Trust you to pick up on that. There are plenty of others who are quite genuine, you know. Well, okay, maybe it is unfair to generalise, but honestly, I'd far rather read a book myself than plough through other people's opinions of one I might want to read in the future.、Mm. There are reams of them, and you've no idea who posts them. People with literary pretensions, I suppose. <laughs> Surely it's good to get a range of views. I'm capable of making up my own mind, thank、mm. you. Well, I write reviews sometimes. It's not as good as swapping ideas with the other members of my reading group, of course. No feedback, but it certainly does focus the mind. I'm sure I get more out of the books as a result. So, do you think it'll turn you into an author too? <laughs> Don't mock. I get plenty of writing practice at work. All those dreary reports.、Mm. So, it's good to be able to write about something I find interesting for a change. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a student called Greg Pritchard talking about his gap year trip to Africa. For questions seven to fourteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part two.
Hi everyone, my name's Greg Pritchard, and I'm going to tell you about an expedition I went on during my gap year. We spent the first week camping in the Kruger National Park in South Africa to see and learn as much as possible about the wildlife there. There's an amazing range of animals, some of the biggest, like elephants, lions, and rhinos, as well as more wild dogs than in any other part of South Africa. Can you believe there are also 517 species of birds and 114 different kinds of reptiles? During the study sessions, we could choose from quite a range of subjects. Climatology was popular, not surprising because of climate change, and animal behaviour was an obvious favourite. I opted for astronomy and hadn't expected to be part of such a large group. Week two was the conservation project. We left the park for the Oliphant's Gorge, the largest breeding ground for the Nile crocodile. Large numbers of crocodiles are dying. It's important to find out why. A huge dam has been built, and it seems the real cause of the trouble is that the river isn't free flowing anymore. We helped with a survey to find how many crocodiles live around the dam. I took part in night patrols in a boat. My partner had to estimate the length of each crocodile we saw, and I noted its location on a handheld GPS. We were told that once this part of the survey was complete, there are plans to plot crocodile movements. Twelve fully grown crocodiles will have radio transmitters fitted to their necks, and younger crocodiles, easier to catch and deal with, will have colour-coded tags fixed on their tails. It was quite a big change to spend the third week on a wilderness trail in the bush. We had no timetable, just walked by day and camped wherever we got to at night. I knew we wouldn't starve; we had just enough provisions to last. But we were encouraged to fend for ourselves. It wasn't too difficult to catch fish, but I was pretty chuffed that I identified some edible plants which we could cook for supper one night. We learnt a lot of practical things, like how to find water and build a shelter, and how to get on with each other. I think I got to be more considerate, though I'm sure the idea is to make people more self-reliant. We spent the final week in a village on the coast. I'd been a bit alarmed about this actually because helping in the local school was mentioned, and I wasn't sure I'd manage with teaching anything like maths. But fortunately, football seems universal. And my coaching in that went down well. During that last week, we experienced a different way of life, completely different from our own. I enjoyed going out on trips with the local fishermen, and joining a family for meals turned out to be the best way to find out about them and their customs. There were plenty of other things to enjoy there: kayaking sessions on the lagoon and snorkeling on the reef. It was a truly wonderful and varied four weeks. Now you'll hear part two again. Hi everyone, my name's Greg Pritchard, and I'm going to tell you about an expedition I went on during my gap year. We spent the first week camping in the Kruger National Park in South Africa to see and learn as much as possible about the wildlife there. There's an amazing range of animals, some of the biggest, like elephants, lions, and rhinos. As well as more wild dogs than in any other part of South Africa, can you believe there are also 517 species of birds and 114 different kinds of reptiles? During the study sessions, we could choose from quite a range of subjects. Climatology was popular, not surprising because of climate change, and animal behaviour was an obvious favourite. I opted for astronomy. And hadn't expected to be part of such a large group. Week two was the conservation project. We left the park for the Oliphant's Gorge, the largest breeding ground for the Nile crocodile. Large numbers of crocodiles are dying. It's important to find out why. A huge dam has been built, and it seems the real cause of the trouble is that the river isn't free flowing anymore. We helped with a survey to find how many crocodiles live around the dam. I took part in night patrols in a boat. My partner had to estimate the length of each crocodile we saw, and I noted its location on a handheld GPS. 
We were told that once this part of the survey was complete, there are plans to plot crocodile movements. Twelve fully grown crocodiles will have radio transmitters fitted to their necks, and younger crocodiles, easier to catch and deal with, will have colour-coded tags fixed on their tails. It was quite a big change to spend the third week on a wilderness trail in the bush. We had no timetable, just walked by day and camped wherever we got to at night. I knew we wouldn't starve; we had just enough provisions to last. But we were encouraged to fend for ourselves. It wasn't too difficult to catch fish, but I was pretty chuffed that I identified some edible plants which we could cook for supper one night. We learnt a lot of practical things, like how to find water and build a shelter, and how to get on with each other. I think I got to be more considerate, though I'm sure the idea is to make people more self-reliant. We spent the final week in a village on the coast. I'd been a bit alarmed about this actually because helping in the local school was mentioned, and I wasn't sure I'd manage with teaching anything like maths. But fortunately, football seems universal, and my coaching in that went down well. During that last week, we experienced a different way of life, completely different from our own. I enjoyed going out on trips with the local fishermen, and joining a family for meals turned out to be the best way to find out about them and their customs. There were plenty of other things to enjoy there: kayaking sessions on the lagoon and snorkeling on the reef. It was a truly wonderful and varied four weeks. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear part of an interview with two board game enthusiasts called Sarah Waters. And Ed Zander about the renewed popularity of traditional board games. For questions fifteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D which fits best according to what you hear. You now have seventy seconds to look at part three. Hello and welcome to the program, where this week we are discussing traditional non-digital board games such as Monopoly and Scrabble. With me are two enthusiasts, Sarah Walters and Ed Zander. Sarah, why do you think traditional board games are becoming more popular again? Well, they were originally designed for families. Consequently, the themes are not typically your fantasy-type aliens or dragons. They're much more from everyday life. Anything from farming to creating your own home. Additionally, we're in a culture where, thanks to recent rapid changes, it's very rare now to meet people who don't play digital games. And as a result, we are far more accepting of play for adults as a legitimate pastime. But the thing is that most games are played on screens. In a world where everything appears to be mediated through an electronic device of some kind. There's a growing desire to put games back on the living room table. And Ed, what do you think this century holds for game playing? Well, people say that our lives are more pressurized, and games are a welcome outlet for this. But I would argue there's much more to it than that. Yes, this century is going to be one of play, but the way we work and learn, communicate with each other, socialize, and form new relationships. 
All these essential aspects of our lives are increasingly carried out via the internet and digital networks, and games, be they digital or traditional, will always mirror these things. But what specifically is their attraction? Digital technology can be isolating, despite social networks and emailing. There's a growing nostalgia for real interaction. At the same time, people are looking for leisure activities that involve solving problems, rather than just passively watching television stories. Board games let us play directly with each other, intimately, face to face, and maybe part of our brain really likes being in a room with other people. The most fun I have playing games—it's not with computers; it's playing board games with friends. Is this phenomenon the same the world over? Well, in parts of Europe, board games are integral to the culture. People seem to live and breathe board games the way we do video games in the USA. For example, they release over 600 brand new board games at Germany's Essen convention every single year. So there's just a massive amount, and participants are all very excited. They've read up extensively on what the latest hot game is. So as soon as the doors open, they can make a beeline for the stalls and get their special game, and just sit down and start playing it. So it's just crazy, enthusiastic board gaming. I've never seen anything like it. It's just amazing. And isn't there some kind of award for the best game each year? Absolutely, the Game of the Year Award, which was started in 1979 in Germany, it's become a real stamp of quality. In the USA, when somebody goes looking for a board game, they might think about trying something new, but they'll usually end up leaving with something they've played before and played as a child. But in Germany, if you see that little red shape on the box. That seal of approval given to games shortlisted for the award, you know it's going to be a good one. So you get people trying new games all the time, and the press have picked up on this too. The event gets great coverage every year. So tell us about your own collections. <laughs> yes, I've got a huge collection. It's hard to resist that temptation to hang on to them. They're all so well crafted, but you know there are game players and then there are collectors. But I'm afraid I'm both. <laughs> I've actually converted my basement into a games room, and yes, I've got a lot. <laughs> I never discard any on principle. Might be worth something one day, you see. I try to get rid of some. You know, if I wasn't playing them, I'd try to chuck a few out. But then a couple of times that rebounded on me, and I've really wished I hadn't got rid of them. So I've stopped doing that. Now, if I buy one, I'm just going to keep it. So let me move on to recent developments. Have there been any updates? Now you'll hear part three again. Hello and welcome to the program, where this week we are discussing traditional non-digital board games such as Monopoly and Scrabble. With me are two enthusiasts, Sarah Walters and Ed Zander. Sarah, why do you think traditional board games are becoming more popular again? Well, they were originally designed for families. Consequently, the themes are not typically your fantasy-type aliens or dragons. They're much more from everyday life, anything from farming to creating your own home. Additionally, we're in a culture where, thanks to recent rapid changes, it's very rare now to meet people who don't play digital games. And as a result, we are far more accepting of play for adults as a legitimate pastime. But the thing is that most games are played on screens. In a world where everything appears to be mediated through an electronic device of some kind, there's a growing desire to put games back on the living room table. And Ed, what do you think this century holds for game playing? Well, people say that our lives are more pressurized, and games are a welcome outlet for this. But I would argue there's much more to it than that. Yes, this century is going to be one of play, but the way we work and learn, communicate with each other, socialize, and form new relationships—all these essential aspects of our lives are increasingly carried out via the internet and digital networks. And games, be they digital or traditional, will always mirror these things. But what specifically is their attraction? Digital technology can be isolating, 
Despite social networks and emailing, there's a growing nostalgia for real interaction. At the same time, people are looking for leisure activities that involve solving problems rather than just passively watching television stories. Board games let us play directly with each other, intimately, face to face. And maybe part of our brain really likes being in a room with other people. The most fun I have playing games, it's not with computers, it's playing board games with friends. Is this phenomenon the same the world over? Well, in parts of Europe, board games are integral to the culture. People seem to live and breathe board games the way we do video games in the USA. For example, they release over 600 brand new board games at Germany's Essen Convention every single year. So there's just a massive amount. And participants are all very excited. They've read up extensively on what the latest hot game is. So as soon as the doors open, they can make a beeline for the stalls and get their special game and just sit down and start playing it. So it's just crazy, enthusiastic board gaming. I've never seen anything like it. It's just amazing. And isn't there some kind of award for the best game each year? Absolutely. The Game of the Year Award, which was started in 1979 in Germany, it's become a real stamp of quality. In the USA, when somebody goes looking for a board game, they might think about trying something new, but they'll usually end up leaving with something they've played before and played as a child. But in Germany, if you see that little red shape on the box that seal of approval given to games shortlisted for the award, you know it's going to be a good one. So you get people trying new games all the time. And the press have picked up on this too. The event gets great coverage every year. So tell us about your own collections. <laughs> yes, I've got a huge collection. It's hard to resist that temptation to hang on to them. They're all so well crafted. But you know, there are game players and then there are collectors. But I'm afraid I'm both. <laughs> I've actually converted my basement into a games room and, yes, I've got a lot. <laughs> I never discard any on principle. Might be worth something one day, you see. I try to get rid of some. You know, if I wasn't playing them, I'd try to chuck a few out. But then a couple of times that rebounded on me and I've really wished I hadn't got rid of them. So I've stopped doing that. Now, if I buy one, I'm just going to keep it. So let me move on to recent developments. Have there been any questions? That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about having more than one job at a time. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, Choose from the list A to H why each speaker took on more than one job. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H the unexpected result of having more than one job that each speaker refers to. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1. I'm currently holding down three roles, sales executive, market stall holder and online jewellery entrepreneur. It's quite a challenge, but not being on a standard career path isn't a worry. That's for traditionalists. I'm not interested in tying myself down to a single job somewhere. Today's workforce is much more fluid and as long as you're proactive, you can make your own path. The best opportunities come from meeting people 
The greater variety of people you come across, the better. Having three jobs has certainly led to a huge increase in my circle of acquaintances across the country, including my husband to be, who was a regular customer at my stall. Speaker 2 Weekdays, I'm in recruitment, but I spend Friday nights at home baking bread to sell at the local Saturday market. I originally did it partly to earn some extra money, but more because I wanted to do something for me, you know, make something completely from scratch. I never dreamed it would take off the way it has. <laughs> Now it's more about how I can improve the process. The money is still just a bonus. I think this phenomenon of working in multiple roles has taken hold because... My generation wants more from work than just a way to pay the rent. I know I wanted a feeling of fulfilment. I expect my work to reflect my values. Speaker 3 I still work as a school drama teacher on a part-time basis, but I stopped my full-time post there so that I could do what I'd always wanted to do, which was to be a freelance theatre director. In many ways, the directing is merely a continuation of what I was doing before with plays and musicals at school. The flexibility of the lifestyle is a huge bonus. I was lucky enough to be able to work with an award-winning director recently in a local theatre project, a chance that came completely out of the blue. I could never have done it with a traditional 40-hour week job. What I do doesn't feel like work. It's creative and enterprising. Speaker 4 Being an electrician and a model may seem weird, but then, as an ex-army man living on a houseboat, I don't really fit into the usual categories. An electrician's job alone would never have done me after life in the military. It was the variety I still craved. So, being asked to do a magazine cover, even a lesser-known one, after only three months modelling was simply a stunning bonus. I love being a freelancer with more than one career, It means a whole new work ethic because it makes you care more. In a salaried job, you can just sit around and you'll always get paid, whereas in my line, you're only as good as your last day's work. Speaker 5 I was once a full-time DJ at a nightclub, which I loved, but I got really fed up with dealing with unreasonable customers. I wanted a new departure. Sure, I still play now, but only on occasional club nights and at wedding receptions earning enough to cover the rent on my studio, where I specialize in designing clothes. So my two jobs couldn't be more diverse. I put in as many hours as I possibly can and do the best that I can do. It's all I really care about. Work comes first and nothing else is important. Winning a prestigious design award, though, I didn't see that coming. I haven't had a holiday for three years, but I don't mind one little bit. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I'm currently holding down three roles. Sales executive, market stall holder and online jewellery entrepreneur. It's quite a challenge, but not being on a standard career path isn't a worry. That's for traditionalists. I'm not interested in tying myself down to a single job somewhere. Today's workforce is much more fluid. And as long as you're proactive, you can make your own path. The best opportunities come from meeting people. The greater variety of people you come across, the better. Having three jobs has certainly led to a huge increase in my circle of acquaintances across the country, including my husband-to-be, who was a regular customer at my stall. Speaker 2 Weekdays, I'm in recruitment, but I spend Friday nights at home baking bread to sell at the local Saturday market. I originally did it partly to earn some extra money, but more because I wanted to do something for me, you know, make something completely from scratch. I never dreamed it would take off the way it has. <laughs> Now it's more about how I can improve the process. The money is still just a bonus. I think this phenomenon of working in multiple roles has taken hold because my generation wants more from work than just a way to pay the rent. I know I wanted a feeling of fulfilment, I expect my work to reflect my values. Speaker 3 I still work as a school drama teacher on a part-time basis, but I stopped my full-time post there so that I could do what I'd always wanted to do, which was to be a freelance theatre director. 
In many ways, the directing is merely a continuation of what I was doing before with plays and musicals at school. The flexibility of the lifestyle is a huge bonus. I was lucky enough to be able to work with an award-winning director recently in a local theatre project, a chance that came completely out of the blue. I could never have done it with a traditional 40-hour week job. What I do doesn't feel like work. It's creative and enterprising. Speaker 4 Being an electrician and a model may seem weird, but then, as an ex-army man living on a houseboat, I don't really fit into the usual categories. An electrician's job alone would never have done me after life in the military. It was the variety I still craved. So, being asked to do a magazine cover, even a lesser-known one, after only three months modelling was simply a stunning bonus. I love being a freelancer with more than one career, it means a whole new work ethic because it makes you care more. In a salaried job, you can just sit around and you'll always get paid, whereas in my line, you're only as good as your last day's work. Speaker 5 I was once a full-time DJ at a nightclub, which I loved, but I got really fed up with dealing with unreasonable customers. I wanted a new departure. Sure, I still play now, but only on occasional club nights and at wedding receptions earning enough to cover the rent on my studio, where I specialize in designing clothes. So my two jobs couldn't be more diverse. I put in as many hours as I possibly can and do the best that I can do. It's all I really care about. Work comes first and nothing else is important. Winning a prestigious design award, though, I didn't see that coming. I haven't had a holiday for three years, but I don't mind one little bit. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time.
That's the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets.